We are far from home. And we cannot risk a winter in this hostile land. She's going to be number four, unless you tell us what we want. You recognize where we are? Pierre Psile, right? Father's will, you say? You think he doesn't know about you and your knight? You think I don't know? When I wanted you to lay with me. Rollo's dead. Took the body. They killed him. Rollo was first, I would have been second. And then you, Peter. You're such an idiot. <laughs> oh, no! Please, Michael! I'm sorry! Boast into your artsy fucking friends about time you spent at Her Majesty's pleasure. Maybe I should leave. Uh I haven't finished with you yet. Sit the fuck down. You must be a fan. No, it's okay. I, I do autographs later on. Okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I think I have a new assistant. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce you to, um, what's his name? Could it be Kevin? I will do as commanded. But it is an assignment from which there will be no return. We can dispatch a few rogues and blackguards, but if we are to encounter an entire legion, there is very little we can do. Eternal life. Immortality. I have almost achieved this, but without the right specimens, I will not be able to accomplish this. I'll tell you why. Their eyes, they inject their filthy thoughts into my head. I've been a psychic medium now for three years, having had a career in journalism. And I've moved to the area, and um, I've done 50 seances um, in London. And uh, while I don't advertise my services, um, I'm, I prefer to go by word of mouth and recommendation. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode on Angela La Petina Presents. Now I have a special guest from United Kingdom. He is a filmmaker, he's an actor and also a writer. His name is John Paul Case. Let's learn more about him. All right. No, but thank you, uh, John, for being my show. And you have a, a, a fantastic resume as a filmmaker, 32 credits as an actor, 11 as a director, five as a writer and 32 as a producer. So this is an honor for me to have you on my show. Thank you so much. And also your interview will be broadcast in Radio Illuminati. So John, what inspired you to be an actor? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I started off actually uh, as a, I wanted to be a sportsman. So mm -hmm. in, in, in this country, I wanted to be a professional soccer player. Mm -hmm. And I, from the ages of nine to 15, uh, well, 14, actually, um, I was lucky and fortunate to be signed on with a professional team in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Then I got an injury to my Achilles, which mm -hmm. is around the, around the ankle area. And unfortunately, I never, when I, I had a year out of the game and I was never quite the same player, but I was very hyperactive as a kid. Mm -hmm. And... Because I was so hyperactive and I had an agent at the time, the agent suggested that I would uh, utilize my talents uh, as a personality. So I started off DJing, you know, being a radio presenter. And from there, um, I was fortunate enough to get a TV series mm -hmm. uh, by the BBC that was shot in Spain and it was called El Dorado. And that, in a way, taught me that year of you know being um th uh, screened on bbc one three times a week it mm -hmm. taught me the business of acting and really 
I suppose, shown me, uh, opened the door of what career I wanted to do, which was, you know, obviously then to be someone else, you know. Um, so that that's my, I suppose, my entry into the into the uh, film industry or the TV and film industry. Wow, fantastic! And what you like, uh, what you like most as an actor? What's the more attractive for that career to you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, pretty much like what probably most of your uh, interviews have said before. You know, it's the opportunity to be someone else, to escape into someone else's skin. Mm -hmm. And I think most actors are kind of like. And when I say actors, I'm talking about the actor person because obviously mm -hmm. there's actresses and and actors. Uh, but I think it's I think it's a case of um, it's really uh, actors are bored with their own personality, so mm -hmm. they want to be someone else. Um, and um, I think, like with anything, as an actor, you want to do different things. Mm -hmm. The problem is in the industry is that if you get a reputation for being good at something. You tend to get those roles again and again and again. Um, and because there's so many people in the industry, it's very difficult to say no, because you know that if you get a reputation for doing something uh, and doing it well, and obviously you get it keep being offered, um, it's like anything. You know, you, you, there's, 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 you have to juxtapose earning a living with of course um uh, creative endeavor and that's mm -hmm. sometimes difficult to you know because the lines are really there's no real you know it, it, it's it's very black and white that you know it, it's 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 very difficult to do it um so so yeah i mean it, it's it, it's as i say i mean um always always want every, people want actors want to play different people but sometimes you tend to get stereotyped into a particular mold so, for example, me, I've I've always really played villains, or I've been playing villains for the last, you know, eight to ten years. Um, and I actually I prefer it anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. I always prefer playing the antagonist opposite a protagonist because the character tends to be more multi layered, um, and also you have more fun with that character. You know, it's mm -hmm. much it's much more fun being bad than being good isn't it you know so um uh well that's 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 what i think anyway yes that's what i heard for all the actors that they do the violence and they feel like it's more fun and they really enjoy it like it's the the opposite to be the good guy the you know the the main role you know it's just that's i can imagine that this is fun because like it says as a violence it's like i, I you, you can do uh you, you the fantasy is in your mind. You can do it as an actor, but something that you're not able to do in real life. So I think it's part of the fun. That's fantastic. Is as a writer, how how is the experience? Because as an actor, now as a writer, and then you can create your own characters, your own story. How are you experience for that? How are you feeling for that? Well, I mean, just just to, just to uh, make make it clear, I don't I don't write um uh fictional um uh, scripts i mean all, all my experience as a director and a writer being factual content so oh, okay. so 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 in a, in essence i'm inspired with true stories um oh, i love it that's my uh, favorite ones <laughs> and, 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 I, and i suppose for me what what's all my documentaries that i've made i've been fortunate to have made uh, I'm interested in public opinion about any subject I choose to explore. Uh, so I'm not really interested. Well, obviously, you have to have an expert opinion on a given subject, but I'm interested in what the ordinary man, woman and child think on the street. Mm -hmm. So from when I when I started my first documentary, which I did on Brexit, you know, the United Kingdom leaving the European Union. Mm -hmm. um, I was inspired to go out on the street and obviously it was an easy documentary or it was easier to get interviews because of course a lot of a lot of citizens of the United Kingdom had a lot of things to say about it um mm -hmm. so so but other documentaries have been much more difficult to get interviews because some of them are more sensitive subjects and people don't want to talk about them you know so exactly. so 
sorry if I'm not answering your question, but in essence, I am. What I'm trying to say is that when you're writing factual content, you have an idea. And the way I tend to work is that I go out uh, and kind of form the, I, 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 I write the skeleton and then I put the flesh on the skeleton mm -hmm. as I go out and have an idea of where the story's taking me. Exactly. Um, and I suppose, I suppose that's the, that's the advantage for me as a, as a factual filmmaker is to go out and, 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 fl and create that story as I'm, as I'm, as I'm progressing, you know, as opposed to writing it, fleshing out the characters and then going out and shooting it. You know what I mean? I so that, that's why, I, that's what I prefer to do, but you know, that's not for everybody. That's just the way I prefer to work. Yes, yes. And the, and the, the, one of the commentaries that the one I like so much and I, I watched actually two times is the vampire and all the research that you made and you make me to learn a lot, even things, even things that I, I didn't even pay attention for you. Um, I like the way how you portrayed like a, at the beginning, there was the demoniatic entity and then it become very romantic and then the romantic become the fun guy. <laughs> Yeah, well, all well, the transition. Is, I like the transition that you explained. How? Thank you, thank you very much. I mean, I, I, I mean, I mean, I, I suppose that's the advantage of 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 having an actor to present because an actor will tend to embody a character, even though mm -hmm. I'm narrating. I'm still telling a story, and I'm trying to tell the story in a fun but also an appropriate way. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I love doing that. I mean, I suppose in a way, because I, I, I mean, I was writing it in my head as I was doing it. So, so in essence, all, what I did is, you know, as you'll see, the, all the narration, mm -hmm. it's all in my head. I didn't have an auto cue. When I, when I would do any of my documentaries, there's no auto cue. It's just, right, okay, this is what I'm going to say. Obviously, as an actor, because you go through the skill of memorizing lines, it was easier as an actor than maybe as a as a presenter, for example, who's used to an auto cue. Sometimes they're used to an auto cue, you know. So, so, but to answer your question, yeah, I mean, um, I I think I I, I I don't know if viewers know this, but. Uh, I, I I did that documentary. There were two reasons why I did that documentary. Mm -hmm. Number one, because I wanted to do uh, some, because th th there's been, I want to distinguish between the facts and the folklore, you know, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and I wanted to give a history of, of, of the uh, vampiric traits. Um, and, uh, but not only that, I was researching to play a character, to play a vampire. So all that research that I did, I thought, well, because not a lot, of, not a lot of people outside the business know how much research an actor does to get into character. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, what better way is to present that on screen so so people know what the process is, or at least, you know, do you know what I mean? In an entertaining way. So it served two purposes. Number one, I wanted to tell the story, but at the same time, I thought, well, I've done all this research, so I might as well show people how much research I've done. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, no, no, it looks very super, super detailed information. And I, when I first time when I saw it, I noticed that all the hard work that uh, you input to this documentary, and I really appreciate it because it's the best documentary about the vampire trajectory I haven't seen. Not because oh, you are you. not because you're my guest. It is what it is. Even my husband he told me the same thing. Hey, I love the way he is structured step by step, and then I like the way you um um explain. You know your uh, not the voice of it, but I say your your presenting the documentary and very very well understanding. Um, no words. It's 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 my favorite uh, documentary about vampires, and I think every everybody on the planet they they feel um, curiosity about these uh, legends. So for some reason, everybody, they will love to watch uh, your documentary. It's just... <laughs> That's right. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, if you look throughout history, um, I mean, it was only really when 
because originally vampire vampires were seen to be shrouds you know they uh, sometimes sometimes bloat creatures and it was mm-hmm. only when bram stoker our uh, you know pen dracula uh, you know showing the vampires this aristocrat this almost you know anemic aristocrat but also very good looking uh mm-hmm. in a in a weird kind of dangerous way i think i think that that that's what i tried to you know give in the documentary but also what a, a, a more a most important thing is a lot of a lot of serial killers mm-hmm. um certainly from the you know the early 20th century onwards have have used vampiric i suppose vampiric um uh you know, vampiric death methods, you know what I mean? Right throughout mm-hmm. history, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, in, in obviously in your country, you had, um, you know, the vampire of Sacramento, you know, who was doing all sorts of things. Richard, um, the Richard Chase, I believe his name was, you know. So, so, so it, I, I think th- what I was trying to do is I was trying to show not only um, uh, there's a, there's a history of, of sightings and um, whether you believe them or not um, uh, is, is your choice. But I think a lot of serial killers have used vampiric folklore to kind of, in a way, uh, get away with things. You know what I mean? You know, so um, it, it's 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 a weird and wonderful, wonderful world we live in, and. Um, um, but it's true, think. it's true. If I try to remember, um, when I try to remember uh, those kind of cases that the press announced, yes, they have some like a some um, inspiration with the vampire techniques and when they kill, especially with a woman and the victims. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, and 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 I mean, even if you go back to. Um, you know the, the I mean the most famous serial killer um, in Victorian times in the United Kingdom. You know Jack the Ripper. Oh um, yes, yes, I remember you, that. One. You could argue um, that um, again the way uh, Jack the Ripper was labelled, whether he was a member of the aristocracy, depending on who you believe, uh, or the royal family, whatever. Um, in a way, he probably was basing his ca- his character maybe on Dracula. You know what I mean? That mm-hmm. kind of that kind of. Um, I mean, I know that uh, obviously Jack the Ripper didn't drink blood, but you know he had he had obviously had a fascination for blood. You know what I mean? So yes, it's, yes. A, it's, the same, it's the same. It's the same, but maybe um, more of an obtuse, you know, li- a link. But you know, yes. at, the, at the same time, there could be a link. You know, so. So yeah, no, it's 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 uh, it's a uh, it's uh, as I say, it's a crazy world we live in. But uh, yes, yeah, so yeah. I think I think those people who are watching this uh, interview or listen to this interview are oh, it's true. They they start connecting and start learning about the things. Uh, that and like in summary about your what your documentary was about. And and John and what about the hunt and you did your leading role for that one was your first one as a leading role for that film right okay so uh, it was actually a series of films um, so uh, it was based on a TV series in the United Kingdom called Most Haunted mm-hmm. and the idea behind it was that you had a medium. You had mm-hmm. a journalist and you had a historian and they would go around various haunted locations to determine whether indeed there was, you know, ghosts and haunted activity there. So what we did or indeed what the filmmakers did is they uh, created a um, at a particular location. They create they you know, they they created this. Uh, tr- this triangle. So I played the medium, uh, but it was completely improvised. So we went to a location not knowing whether there was any haunted activity or not. And it was up to us as actors to to make the audience believe that there was haunted activity there. Mm-hmm. 
So, so, and I, to be honest with you, as an actor, that's the way I prefer to work because mm -hmm. sometimes when you do your research, you're focused on that character you're playing. Whereas sometimes when writers write scripts, they have so many characters to think about that sometimes they don't do that character that you're playing justice. You know what I mean? You know, so, so, so sometimes improvisation allows the actor to add more and more layers to the character one is playing. And from the filmmaker's perspective, it probably will, you know, add more weight to, to, to the script. So anyway, so, so we made five of them. Uh, the first one was called Ghosts. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other four were under the title of Haunted. So they went Haunted 2, Haunted 3, Haunted 4, Haunted 5. And they're available on most platforms worldwide. I mean, they've done, you know, Fantastic. runs on Amazon Prime, mm -hmm. you know, so... But no, I mean, I mean, I, I, as I say, I, I think over the last few years as an actor, I've tended to work more in horror. Um, I've been doing a lot of um, horror films. But before that, I was doing a lot of gangster films, you know, um, and uh, I've done a lot of action adventure films, you know, where I've played Fantastic. again the antagonist, mm -hmm. you know. So, so yeah, so um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean... I just love creating and being different people. Awesome. And what about your experience working with Howard Ford with the lockdown hunting? How was the experience working with him? Yeah, well, Howard's a great guy. He's a fabulous filmmaker. In fact, you know, he's, you know, he's, I mean, he's, he's definitely one of the most talented filmmakers I've had the pleasure of working with. I mean, he's, he, the thing about him is, I mean, I've only worked with him once and it was only a, uh, a short I, I played a character called the spitter within lockdown haunting so so I was a real nasty piece of work and of course as the name suggests that's what I did so of course you know during covid you know uh spitting was well it's it's a criminal offense anyway and uh obviously even during covid it was even more <laughs> Of a uh, of a terrible and a uh, uh, nasty nasty offense. So, so yeah. So um, I mean, in essence, you know, Howard uh, uh, called me up and said, uh, "I've got this role. I think you'd be perfect for." And you know, he allowed me to improv and bring bring something to the character because I think there was only a couple of lines that he wrote for me. And then obviously, I improv did my bit, and he liked it and and went with it. So. So yeah, but he, he he's a he's a very talented filmmaker, you know he really is. And uh, what the good thing about him is that he's able to work in different genres, you know. So mm -hmm. um, he's not just fixed to a, a particular genre; he's able to transcend genre. Awesome, fantastic, and yeah, especially especially that during the COVID, the, during the pandemic, I can imagine no because there was nobody know what's happening the virus and be able to work on that, and there was. And the way he made the film, you cannot notice it was during the pandemic. It looks, <laughs> looks like a very normal feature film. Yeah, no, indeed, indeed. Because what he did, I think uh, because of COVID and because in essence he couldn't get a crew, um, I think he went to actors' homes and then shot at their homes, you know. Yes, um, yes, yes. And, uh, I mean, I was looking. My my scene was outside. It was in in the city of London. So, so uh, we didn't have those. Uh, uh, what's the word? Um, two. Well, we we certainly had the two meter rule imposed, but uh, we um, we were out in the fresh air. Assuming that is fresh air, of course. You know, in London, it's probably uh, rather polluted. But uh, that's another story. <laughs> And yes, yes. Another another film that I love that I also I love to watch was the Suority. How was your experience with that film working with the film director James Weber? Oh, you know, another another great filmmaker. Yeah, I mean, I mean, again, again, I only had a very small role in that a cameo. I played a, a cafe owner um, who who um, was a rather bossy and commanding to Kate Dickey. Uh, mm -hmm. who's one of the leads, you know, uh, who's been in, uh, she's a Scottish actress who's 
there's been a lot of stuff the star wars game you know, of thrones yes game of thrones yeah yeah and uh yeah she's 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 great you know um um and uh, so the other actresses that were in it i mean i i was only on it you know for for a couple of days but um uh from what i saw you know the the three girls gelled really well um and um and as I say, James is another another talent, and he's going on to bigger and better things. Mm -hmm. Fantastic! You know, I I love both of the films, and uh, it's and sort of a very beautiful story. And and what about um? Let, let, let's get back to the documentary. What about the London Bridge is falling down? Can you tell us more about that? Uh, okay, film? so so um. For years, um, people have always asked the question, uh, if I asked you, for example, and this is not just people outside the United Kingdom, this is also people outside of London. If I mm -hmm. ask most people, uh, what, tell me, where is the London Bridge? Most people, when you say London Bridge, they would ultimately think of Tower Bridge. Now, because it's it's more attractive, it's more appealing. But what people don't realize is that Tower Bridge was only built in 1894. Mm. Yet London Bridge and the bridge that an American called Robert P. McCulloch bought in 1968, uh, the stretch of water the bridge occupies has been there since 43 AD. In other words, there's been a bridge since Roman times, 43 AD, so over 2,000 years. So anyway, uh, number one, I wanted to dispel the notion that this is London Bridge, not uh, Tower Bridge. That's the first thing. The second thing is, is that for a long time, people have thought that he bought the wrong bridge because people thought he, he was buying Tower Bridge, right? Mm -hmm. But also, um, I, I wanted to look into the story of why did he want to buy this, this bridge and why did he transport it brick by brick mm -hmm. to Lake Havasu in, uh, in Arizona? Why did he do it? You know, what mm -hmm. was the reasons for it? Mm -hmm. Was he pushed? You know, what um what what were the political influences of the day etc cetera, etc cetera. so what i did i interviewed a journalist who's written a book uh on the subject i also interviewed um uh a very various bridge engineers who were uh, instrumental in building the new bridge uh, that sits on the Thames at the moment since 1972. I interviewed them. Mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, other people that were associated with the uh, London City Corporation who actually sold it uh, to Robert P. McCulloch in 1968. So, so yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's available on 2B, in the United States, it's available. It's not on Amazon because Amazon, unfortunately, don't take documentaries anymore. Mm. Um, uh, it's available on YouTube. It's available on other platforms that I can't think of, but it's available anyway. So available. On, I think it's available on Roku, Roku channels. Um, the thing is, London Bridge, the London Bridge was built at a time where uh, the, the, the age of the motorways, or as you call them, freeways in the United States. And um, yes. uh, it was the age of the motor car. You know, it was the 19, you know, 1970s, and uh, it was all about getting in the motor car to improve transportation from A to B. And, of course, it was built to replace John Rainey's bridge that was mm -hmm. was literally falling down. Well, actually, it was sinking. It was sinking an inch every eight years. Mm -hmm. uh, so they had to sell it. They had to get rid of it. Um, yes. But they didn't know how. And uh, a gentleman by the name of Ivan Lukin, who yes. was a city councillor, said, listen, I've got a great idea. Why don't we sell it? Better mm -hmm. still, why don't we sell it to America? 
So he found uh, an American um, uh, billionaire who just happened to have a piece of land in Arizona and it was desert. And he wanted to create a community. And he thought, well, better way of creating a community uh, because unfortunately America doesn't have the history like um, Britain does, Great Britain does. So he bought this bridge and what better way of, of, of showing history and have, than having a 2000 year old bridge, you know? So, mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah, so that's, that's basically the story behind it. Yes. That's beautiful. So next time when I, when I get back to London, so I will be more educated <laughs> on that type indeed, of topic. Indeed. No, you should, you should, you know, and as I say, you know, I mean, I mean, there's so many, there's so many landmarks in, 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 you know, London. Um, no, I mean, not, I mean, not just the bridges. I mean, there's just so many landmarks. So yes, much yes, yes. Um, um, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually thinking about doing a follow up on, on, but not on London bridge, but on all the bridges and the history around That's the awesome. Thames, you know, so, mm -hmm. so but, but it's it's getting the time to do it, and um, you know I'm 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 trying to fit it in, uh, fit it again, you know, when I'm not acting, you know. So I mean I'm 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 soon off to Greece uh, to shoot a thriller at the end of this month, and awesome. um, yeah, so for uh, you know so so it, you know I, what I try and do is I try and fit in the documentaries when I'm when I'm not acting, you know. So um um which is, you know, sometimes more difficult to do than not, you know. Yes, absolutely. So I see that you're current in several, in several um, or many pro projects. I was checking your MD page, but the one called a lot to my attention because I'm a Mexican-American is the Mexican Connection. Can you tell us about that project? Yeah, well, it's made um, by a filmmaker and also actor, quite a well-known actor called Damien Chapa, mm -hmm. who was in Blood In, Blood Out. He played Miko in Blood In, Blood Out, which is, I think, as probably within the Latino community, as big as um, Boys in the Hood, you know, for the... Uh, uh, other you know the, the the you know the other ethnic minority community yes. um so um it was shot in uh, florida um mm -hmm. in april um in jacksonville florida mm -hmm. um and essentially yeah i mean it, it damien is actually half he has some mexican roots so um I, I he was playing as well as directing. He was playing the lead character, mm -hmm. uh, and I played a member of the uh, of the gang. Um, mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, it was fun. It was fun. Lots of uh, you know, it's an action movie, so it was a lot of a lot of um, running around, a lot of physicality, um, uh, lots of fight sequences, and. Yeah, no, it was, it was, I really enjoyed it. I spent, uh, I was shooting for what, 30 odd days. Awesome. In, uh, yes, I see well, your Facebook. You're always acting one to another one, one to another. So fantastic. So proud of you. you. So do you have happy. any, yes, yes, yes. And an honor for me to have in my show, you know, as you're very, uh, very, very super talent actor. And, and I love it. Now I like more how you explaining me now how you make your deep research for your documentaries and your passion as an actor but besides that one uh, do you want to share any project in particular that you are working on to the audience yeah well i mean i, I i've just finished a horror comedy called the haunted studio um mm. directed by chris sanders of black copies films who i've worked with on um uh, various occasions um check that out that'll be coming out next year awesome. uh, as i say I'm, I'm on to a um a uh, film in greece called the gimp and the hitman and i'll uh, let you uh uh come to your own conclusions as to which character i'm playing is it the mm. gimp or the hitman but anyway um and uh then i'm on to another project which i can't say too much about um at the moment until it's confirmed we can leave it for another interview later <laughs> yes 
And then I'm going back to the States and then I'm going back to the US. Um, awesome. To, to do a bigger project over there. So, yeah, so um, all things being equal. But you know how it is, Angela, you know, you, there's no point saying that you're doing this or that until you know that the money's in the bank or at least yes you know, yes so, yeah you know. it, it is it's like especially independent um in the film industry they promise the money and they give it back and they give the put them i'm sorry put the money in and put the, get the money back <laughs> so it's like a and the actual people are filming is when we can say oh we are making this film <laughs> that's right that's right yes yes yeah 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 it's uh it's it's you know it's it's a funny business you know it's um uh, it's very up and down. It's like a pendulum, up and down, up down. You know, so. Uh, but you know, you you just have to. You just have to. You know, I mean, I've been in the game a long time now, twenty something years, and exactly. Uh, but year, um, but I know it's like it last, you know. Yes, absolutely. But I noticed like a uh, independent in the film industry and getting more popular. And I heard for for just uh the audience. The people are preferring nowadays watching independent films that typical Hollywood, you know, super high budget films. So they've not more people are getting more involved to get following independent film directors and things like that. I'm one of yeah, them. I, I, I think that's the way it should be as well because there's a lot of talent that oh, yes. unfortunately because of the budgets they they don't get recognized um, mm. because. And and you know you can kind of understand it because you know the the, pro the problem is is that the 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 independent movie and the big budget movie is always priced at the same level. And I'm talking mm -hmm. about you know DVD or or you know you know that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And the problem is is that you know if you've got a low budget movie, a micro budget movie, and it's priced to say. 10 bucks for example and then you've got the latest tom cruise mission impossible or top gun price at the same price well there's no way on earth that the micro budget film is going to be as good as as you know top gun or whatever mm -hmm. that big budget movie is so of course that's the problem because then people think well if i've spent the same amount of money i'm being short changed mm -hmm. so what what should happen is that that low budget movie, that mi micro budget movie, should be priced accordingly, say two pounds, mm -hmm. and then you know, people would say, well, okay, for two pounds, that's less than a pint of beer, for example, um, and 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 so as a result, you know, I don't mind, uh, you know, you know, in other words, you're valuing it to the level of the budget, you know, and the level of the expertise, you know. Um, so, so yeah, so I, I think that's the problem with the, the distribution yes. of independent yeah, yes. film. You know? mm -hmm. It's true. It's true. Because like you say, some people will say, why I want to pay the same amount with this, with maybe not famous actors. And I go for that one for the same price. And I know, uh, this, uh, a class actor. And, but like you say, I think the distribution is not kind of fair, you know, because they put the same price, but at the end of the day, this affecting the number of sellings for the independent film industry. Yes, I, I, I got you. I never thought about that, but yeah, it's true. It's true. It's true. Like me, not, not, not because I, I, I interview a lot of people from the independent film industry, but that's the films I watch more. I like more independent. I am a strong supporting believer of the talents from the independent sector. I love it. That's that's me. Yeah, I mean, I mean, because they're the lifeblood that hopefully will go on to bigger budget things. I mean, you've only got to take the example of Christopher Nolan. I mean, when he he had a film that was running, I think it ran for eight weeks mm -hmm. called The Following uh, in Leicester Square. And it was so good, they wouldn't remove it because everybody mm -hmm. kept saying, we want to see this film. Uh, and there was a lot of people that came back to rewatch it. Exactly. Uh, more, more than once. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of filmmakers that are on the cusp of becoming the new Christopher Nolan. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, but you, you know, like with anything, sometimes the because of of your digital technology now, 
the, 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 there's, it's a good thing and a bad thing. The bad thing is, is that the there's so many films being made now. So as a result, how do you determine what is good and what isn't? In other words, what I mean by that is that it's very difficult because you have to watch so many films yes. to determine what's a good film and what's a bad film, you know? Um, or I should say your, t- your time is occupied more. Um, so, so, but the, but the good thing is, is that, that at least those people do get an opportunity um, to showcase their talent, but it's just a, it's just a minefield trying to find out, you know, what's, 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 the, what's the gem and what isn't. Yes. Yes. Fantastic. And, and just uh, the last question I asked to all people I invite to my shows, uh, what advice you can share to those people who wants to be who wants to be in this film industry? I suppose that, I mean, I think really whether you're in front or behind the camera, you've got to have a passion. Um, You know, you've got to really want to do it. Uh, I don't, I mean, there's so many people now coming into the industry for the wrong reasons. And what I mean by that is that they're they're advocating the, uh, the old adage, the, the 15 minutes of fame. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you've got to be in it because you're passionate. You know, you've got to be in it because you want to act. You've got to be in it because you want to tell stories. Um, um, but at the same time, in order to, you've got to have a, you've got, to, uh, I suppose as a filmmaker, you've got to, you've got to be commercial. Uh, what I mean by that is there's no point if you don't find out whether your story, you might think it's good, mm-hmm. but unless you do research to determine whether other people want to see it, mm-hmm. that's the key. There are a lot of filmmakers that come into the business and think, right, well, my story is so brilliant and everybody wants to see it, yet they don't do research to determine whether actually people do want to see it or not. So that's the key. Come in with passion but also coming with realistic aspirations. In other words, mm-hmm. you know, do research to determine whether your your film is 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 warranted to be made. Um, and I think I think that's the key. And as far as an actor's concerned, yeah, again, do it because you want to act and you want to be different people, and you can't do anything else. Don't come into it because you want to be famous because it doesn't work. Believe you me, yes. it doesn't. You know, yes. um, so this, you know, this, re- this reminds me, uh, when I was doing coaching to students because I years, years, years before I worked for, for the university, um, and I was coaching students. And the first thing that some of the students they say, I want to be a doctor because I want to make money. Mm-hmm. And there was a question I asked. Which major, which major do you think is, can make more money? And this engineering, doctors, and this, this, this. And I told him, what about working the beauty salon? And he says, what? Yeah. Yes, it says depends how good and your passion you put in your, in your career. I have a friend in Monterrey, Mexico, that that he he makes a lot of money because he does to celebrities, politicians, and all these things. And he 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 did he didn't have any necessary no need for him to be a doctor or engineering or overwork in education field, but at the end, he's making more money than anyone else. <laughs> and then the student, the, the response to me, oh, yes, I never thought about that, means. <laughs> yeah, But it's like yeah, a, so the, the key is if you come with a mentality with fame, money, all these things, it's not your passion. That's right. That's right. And, 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 and people will see through it. That you know you're there for the wrong reason. You're there, you know, from a um, purely a commercial point of view. There's no creativity, no creative endeavor attached to it, and and that's that's the, I suppose a problem, you know. So so yeah, you're right. You know, it's uh, it's it's all about um, uh, being focused and um, and and wanting to better your craft, whether you're exactly. in front or behind the camera. 
Well, thank you, John, Lovely. for being on my show. It was an honor. Nice to meeting you. Looking forward to do more interviews with you to follow up with your fantastic career. And looking forward for more uh, documentaries because it's very educational. And I love the educational ones. Eso es genial. Uh, muchas Rewind. gracias. Uh, muchas, muchas gracias. Uh, hasta pronto. Hasta pronto. Hasta pronto. Okay. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. Well, hasta luego. Take care. Okay. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.